for having me here. Um, my name is Daniela Miranda. I'm from the University of Notre Dame. And uh, we are doing this work with PFIs in fish for around two years in partnership with the Sea Grant. We, have some, uh, we had some grant from Sea Grant that resulted in this work and we are starting a new, a new one, a new project that Gary is going to talk about. So, but before talking about PFAS in fish, let's talk about what does PFAS mean. So PFAS is the acronym for this long name that you can see here, per in polyfluoroquine substances. And this is a group of man-made compounds, more than 10, 12,000 compounds that are combined in this small name, this PFAS name. And this compound, I'm just gonna highlight some uh, chemical structures so you can understand why we are concerned about those compounds and why we talk so much about them. So here, maybe it's kind of difficult to see, but we have like a, this, in the structure, we have the carbon and the fluorine bond, bond, bond. And this carbon fluorine is the strongest bond in the, that we can find with the, chemi with the chemicals. And those compounds, they are very hard to break down. So once they are released, on the, once they are created, it's very hard to break them down. And uh, with those 15,000 compounds, they're gonna have different structures depending on how they are combined. So we always have the carbon and fluorine chain and we can have different structures in their head. So they are um, they have higher affinity to the water and also higher affinity to oil. So they are these molecules that stick to everything. Here I'm uh, is illustrating uh, the compounds and thus showing that they can be divided in different gro groups. So always when you, call, when, when you talk about PFIs in fish, PFIs in some other place, we are talking about a huge, a huge, huge group of compounds. Probably already heard about, or if you didn't hear about that, you're gonna hear a lot here in this presentation about PFOA and PFOS. Those are the most known compounds, not only because of how efficient they were, like in the past, but also because they are very toxic and also very persistent in the environment. And here just showing that Yes, it's a huge group of compounds. And uh, in 2017, this paper was released showing that there were around 3,000 compounds. This was in 2017. We are now in 2023 uh, talking about more than 15,000. So every year we're discovering more and more of those compounds in everywhere, in, every, in, every, in several applications. So, okay, we talked about those compounds, but where can we find them? They are basically in our day-by-day -day basis. We can find them in non-stick cook cookware, in that, like a Teflon pan that you like to fry things, that's not non-stick, they are there. They are also in water-resistant uh, jackets, avoiding the water to get, to get to the jacket. And also in food packaging, for example, popcorn, microwave popcorn. They are there to avoid our hands to get greasy when we touch the, touch the package or fr fries packaging as well. And other applications like in makeup and that get in contact with our skin. And other things like our firefighting foams, they are also there. And recently they were ev even found in toilet paper. So they are everywhere, basically everywhere. And why do we care if they are in our day-by-day -day basis? So first, talking about the wildlife, I listed some, some problems, some uh, deleterious effects that PFAS can cause, PFAS were related to. And I'm, I can highlight here the decrease in fish larval body length and also potential indu induction of difference in sex ratio. So those were uh, experiments in the laboratory that showed those things. And we are concerned about that because it's not, it's not gonna, just going to affect a, an individual. It will also, in large scales, can affect populations of fish, can affect uh, the, the whole ecosystem, can affect different communities. 
and also for us we are concerned about those compounds because they were really the exposure to those compounds were related to different kinds of cancers and even uh, uh, low birth weight they were also related to the low response in vaccine it's not vaccines not listed here but they were also related to that so where we already know what PFAS mean, what does PFAS mean, and uh, why do we, ha do we care about them, and how do they get in the environment, how do they get to the aquatic, uh, what aquatic bodies, water bodies. They can be released through the domestic waste, so they are not normally uh, trapped in wastewater treatment plants, so when the domestic waste goes to the wa water treatment plant, they are not cap captured there, there, and they can be released to the water, also ag agricultural waste and the industrial waste. So once they are, had some animation here. Once they are released, they can travel to the ocean, they can be uh, partitioned, they, they can go to the atmosphere. And the thing that we are also concerned about is not about the water, because we drink, sometimes we drink the water, but also the potential for them to bioaccumulate in the organism so they can, some of them, can accumulate in the organism's tissues, the muscle for fish, for example, liver or other tissues, and they can also uh, go up in the food chain. So when one animal preys the other one, the concentration is going to increase. I know that I don't have to talk about the importance of Great Lakes here, but it's in my slides, so I'm going to talk anyways. We know that 20% of the world, uh, world surface uh, fresh water is here in the Great Lakes and th this region also it's important not only uh, when you talk about the environment but also in term terms of economy so with this region we can produce is the driver for more than 7,000 jobs and also uh, contextualizing with the with this meeting we are very concerned about the uh, Great Lakes fishery. As I said, it's the, the region is important not only for uh, recreational, but also we feed lots of people with fish that uh, are collected in the Great Lakes. And with the, our work, we all, uh, also think about the, the justice, the environmental justice about those about, uh, related to those fish, because there are some community in the Great, Great Lakes that they have only fish as their protein. So they, are, they rely on those fish to feed. And if, if we are uh, providing contaminated fish to them, they're not gonna have other choice. They cannot avoid this protein. So it's why we are also concerned about that. Gary Lamberry. So now Gary is gonna talk about the the project and some results as well. Thank you. Oh, yeah. All right, everyone hear me okay? Ooh, that's loud. Great. Um, thanks, Daniela. We ought to thank Daniela for that intro. <laughs> Daniela is actually an expert in PFAS. She did her uh, thesis uh, in Brazil on, on PFAS and partly in Sweden as well. Um, she's forgotten more about PFAS than I know, but uh, I'll present some project results anyway. But I got to tell you, these evening um, presentations are always kind of kind of strange. I feel like I should be on my second glass of wine or third beer or something by now, but uh, maybe later. Okay, so. Um, some of the funding from Sea Grant and some other agencies uh, that have funded our work. Um, you can't, probably too small to see, but really what we're trying to do um, with this, and I'll just highlight two of these. I'm not going to talk about number two. It's really kind of just basically quantify the concentration and the composition of these compounds in uh, Lake Michigan fishes. So we're, we're primarily focused on Lake Michigan, and I think most of you are as well. Um, and we also want to know the, uh, the potential for relocation of these Great Lakes PFAS um, into tributaries that flow, that flow into the Great Lakes, not just Lake Michigan itself, 
but the tributaries as well that flow into it. And you already know that there's this big family, right? Thousands of compounds that are in the environment of, that we generically refer to as PFAS, but there are many thousands of compounds represented here. So um, I'm going to give you um, the take-home messages right now, right up front, so you don't even, you can zone out on the rest of the talk if you want to, but here are the take-home messages, right? So regrettably, um, every fish that we've sampled from Lake Michigan has measurable PFAS in their bodies. It's different in the different organs, but they all have uh, measurable PFAS. The most frequently detected compound is the one that Daniela mentioned, PFOS, a sulfonated compound, which environmentally is also the most common that we find throughout the environment. It's been voluntarily, voluntarily phased out of production in the US, but it's still in the environment and they're persistent and it will be around for a long time. So keep in mind PFOS as one of the chemicals uh, constituting PFAS. These uh, PFAS, as I kind of mentioned, uh, accumulate differently across organ systems of fish, including the embryos, and we'll get to that in a minute. And then PFAS can translocate from Lake Michigan fishes, those that migrate up into the tributaries in their bodies. So the, this, the material, the chemicals are in their bodies. Wherever the fish moves, you know, that was already talked about by Chris, Wherever they move around, they can transport these chemicals with them. Okay, so keep that in mind as well. Think about where fish move. You just saw that very elegantly. So here's the, um, here's the money slide right here. So this is the basic result. And what this shows is the concentration of PFAS, various compounds that you cannot read from your vantage point, but it was represented by the different colors in these different fish. Uh, the ones that we've sampled, actually people have sampled for us. We don't have a vessel, so these have been sampled for us by some of our partners and given to us for PFAS analysis. On the left side is the raw concentration, so just the concentration of, uh, of PFAS. And on this is in nanograms, which is very <laughs> small amounts, per gram of wet weight of the fish. On the right is the relative concentration, so this scales to 100%. So that is like if you were considering these sort of all on a 100% scale, what the relative concentration is of these compounds. So maybe, you know, let's focus more on the left hand, and these are the different species, right? These are prey fish on the top, you know, five of them, which consist of scul slimy sculpin, deep water sculpin, which you could read these from your, your angle. Alewife, okay, important forage fish, bloater, and then an invasive fish around goby, well, so is alewife. And then down here, down here are pre uh, uh, predator fish, these are all salmonids. So this one here is uh, Chinook, lake trout, rainbow trout, steelhead, and then coho down here at the bottom. So you see the images over here. So they all have PFAS on their bodies. Um, not surprisingly, prey fish generally have lower concentrations than their predators because of the bioaccumulation um, aspect. You are what you eat. And so as predator fish are feeding on these, such as alewife particularly, um, they're accumulating those pollutants. Interestingly, sculpin, deep water sculpin, have some of the highest concentrations in their bodies. This one's sort of off scale here relative to the other. But sculpin were loaded with, with PFAS, probably because of where they live. They live on the bottom, and they're exposed to uh, PFAS that actually attach and bind with the sediments. So the sediments are kind of a trapping area, uh, a deposition area for PFAS. It's in the water column as well of the lake, but also on the bottom. And so a bottom-dwelling organism will be exposed to more PFAS. And so the most common one, which is this darkest color right here, is, as you might expect, PFOS, the one that's uh, most common in the environment that has been phased out but will still be with us for a long time. And the others are other, the other colors are just a cocktail of other compounds that are in their bodies. And these are only the 20 that we measured. Remember, there are thousands of these compounds. Uh, analytically, 
you can measure up to 100 now on an instrument, a mass spec instrument. But um, we can do 20 right now in our operation, actually up to 30 now, and it's getting better and better to analyze these different compounds. So keep this in mind, um, predator fish here, prey fish there, let's go up in a little higher, and let's sort of get to some other nuances here. And so if we look at the fish that you might be interested in, Chinook, Coho, Lake Trout, and Steelhead, Rainbow Trout, uh, the concentration, you know, across these four different species of 15 of these PFAS compounds that we can analyze in this case. Uh, here are Chinook salmon up here, so they, these longer lived, larger bodied uh, salmon tend to have higher concentrations of PFAS as you might expect, expect because they have longer life cycles, they're exposed more, they eat more, they grow larger, they bioaccumulate more PFAS which is somewhat different than coho, which are a little lower. These are all kind of in the same ballpark anyway. Uh, lake trout, again, a very long, long lived, uh, up to 30 years, I believe, for some lake trout are, you know, positioned about right there, kind of in between also large bodied, um, long lived. Rainbow trout, a little different, of course, because they're migratory. They go up rivers to spawn. They can come back to the lake, go spawn again. So they're utilizing various habitats in their life cycle. But, you know, there aren't, you know, great differences among these. Once you get to be a large salmonid in, um, in Lake Michigan, you're going to have some PFAS in your body. Are there differences in, in different areas of uh, Lake Michigan? Well, not really. Uh, we've obtained, from our partners, we've obtained samples from four quadrants of Lake Michigan, sort of the uh, northwest, the northeast quadrant, so northwest is kind of Green Bay area, um, no, northeast sort of Traverse Bay and general area, and then the southwest and the southeast. And the concentrations across all of these species I just showed you is pretty much the same. We have a small sample size from, south, from the southwest sector, you know, around um, Chicago, et cetera, but we're trying to beef up that particular sample size. But the concentrations do not differ, maybe not surprisingly, because these fish are moving all around uh, Lake Michigan. They're not staying in one sector. So when you sample fish, they could have been exposed to any part of the lake over their life cycle. It gets more interesting in, in my mind, sort of as, a, as an aquatic ecologist and a river guy myself, when we start thinking about uh, movements of fish, and it's great to have led off with the acoustic telemetry work to think about how fish move around. And so um, what we, we're showing on the left here is the concentration of PFAS in, um, in, sal in salmon. These are Chinook and coho salmon that we're sort of combining here. A sample size of 87 fish there's really no difference in their PFAS load between males and females. So when they're out in the lake, they're growing in the lake, they're basically eating the same thing, whether you're a male or a female, you're accumulating uh, PFAS in your bodies at about the same rate, so there's really no difference um, in PFAS load, body burden as we call it, whether you're a male or a female salmon out in Lake Michigan. However, you know, uh, those that don't get harvested out in the lake that return to a hatchery uh, or they, they, they're naturalized and they go up a river and they spawn in that river. And as, as you know, for all salmon spawn and die, it's a one-way street for them. But as they go up the river to spawn and many of the tributaries, especially in, in Michigan, the state of Michigan, have a naturalized run of salmon going up them now that find places to spawn and drop their eggs. If you look at that, um, something very interesting happens. Female muscle, and this is muscle tissue, female muscle tissue drops in the concentration of PFAS, whereas male muscle tissue remains about the same. It really doesn't change. However, for females, their eggs are loaded with PFAS. About, this is a broken scale. It's about 100 times higher PFAS in the eggs than it is in the females, in the female muscle tissue, which suggests um, that there's maternal offloading, that is, 
females, unfortunately, are transferring their PFAS load to their embryos. And those embryos that are then uh, being scattered around the river, uh, fertilized, and then presumably hatch, uh, are expressing a, quite a high load of, uh, of PFAS. So you have this um, deposition of, of uh, PFAS from female muscle tissue and probably other organ systems as well. To, uh, to their eggs in the process of, of their egg laying and egg maturation as they go upriver. So um, we're kind of referring to this as the rivering PFAS cycle now. Um, I know you're mostly concerned about the fish out in the lake, but I think we also have to be concerned once they go upriver, because they're harvested by people upriver, and they're also laying their eggs. So if you think about this cycle of of large salmon, of salmon maturing in the lake, putting on most of their growth from anywhere from a couple, maybe to five years or so, Bolt, bolting up river um, to spawn like all salmon do. And then some of those being harvested um, as they're going up river along, along with the PFAS that they're carrying. But maybe even more importantly, well, that, that's quite important to the people that are harvesting those and potentially eating them, but also they're releasing their eggs uh, there where they spawn. And those eggs then, we know, are being consumed by, um, by resident fish. This is a brook trout here, but many resident fish are consuming those eggs because they're wonderful little packets of, of energy and fat. And we know that there's transfer of, of PCBs and other contaminants to those fish. And so now we're concerned about, and we have a project to work on this, concerned about the transfer of PFAS uh, from those eggs to the uh, fish in uh, the resident fish in the stream that are feeding on those. But even then, the carcasses then um, that remain in the stream after those uh, salmon spawn and die are then being harvested by, you know, or higher organisms, wildlife that are consuming those. And those that don't are, are decomposing in the river and presumably releasing materials back into the river. I think um, probably one of the Think one of the questions you might be asking is like, what does this mean? Um, what is the PFAS load in the, the fish that you're interested in, that you harvest, that you have you know, uh, uh, clients um, interested in? What does that really mean? Well, we don't have any real regulations on PFAS consumption right now. There are no regulations uh, for PFAS consumption. There are um, in fish. There are advisories, and the EPA is developing criteria for drinking water right now that's in review. But there are no uh, criteria or um, uh, laws about actual consumption of, of fish you know, relative to PFAS concentration, but there are advisories. For example, the state of Michigan a few years ago um, listed 38 parts per billion of PFOS, which is just one PFAS compound, as an acceptable concentration, fillet concentration, to consume salmon, uh, salmon material, a uh, salmon meal weekly. This is based on a certain consumer weight, the, you know, the human and the portion of the serving. Uh, the Great Lakes Consortium a couple of years ago listed 50 uh, parts per billion as a recommendation of PFAS as an acceptable concentration to consume uh, these fish, fish material weekly on a slightly different consumer weight. So if we take sort of those two advisories from the basin here that have relevance to Lake Michigan, what does that really mean relative to what we saw as a concentration in the bodies of these fish? So what's showing here is all the fish we sampled, those 87 fish or so, um, large fish from Lake Michigan, and then the concentration of PFOS in their bodies. So some are really low, you know, some are higher, you know, a fair amount are, are in this range, and then some are actually, you know, at the higher range up here. But the advisories um, from State of Michigan and the Great Lakes Consortium are higher than that. So that's the good news, that all of these fish that you're presumably harvesting currently are below these advisory consumptions. So, whew, kind of thing. They have PFAS in their bodies, but it's below this advisory level. So that, that itself, you know, we have to do a little math here and normalize for human weight and things like that. But those levels, you know, 
none of these fish exceeded those current advisories by those that are doing that work. Yeah? Is that for the whole fish or just the flesh? That is just for the muscle <coughs> tissue. Okay. And that's a great nuance because I, I should have included this slide. The muscle tissue, fortunately, is the lowest of all the organ systems in the body. Um, you know, way lower than eggs, you already saw that. Lower than liver, lower than gallbladder, lower than blood, lower than stomach, lower than heart. So muscle tissue, gratefully, is lower. You know, wouldn't suggest eating a lot of body, um, um, belly fat, but it's lower than, right, than the other organ systems, which is good news. Maybe not for an organism that's eating the whole fish, but at least for humans. But I want to actually um, give a little bit of maybe not so good news. Um, the European Food Safety Authority, who is also dealing with PFAS in their fish, you know, throughout, you know, throughout Europe, PFAS is a, is a big problem, has a much lower standard. Um, we had to do some math here, but they combined four PFAS compounds, the most common ones, those four listed here, including our friend PFAS over here, but PFOA and some other ones as well. Those are the structures. And so they list this four nanograms of the combined four compounds per kilogram body weight as their weekly intake. Now we had to do some math again to translate that into the same units as, as you saw before, but I do need to show you. And then here's the same plot of those fish, we know with higher concentrations and, and lower concentrations. And the European uh, Safety Authority puts it, puts it down here. And so um, much more conservative in their recommendations. And so their estimate is like all of these fish exceeds the advisories of the, of the Europeans, you know, that we're seeing in Lake Michigan. So um, you have to sort of accept that reality along with what being advised here. And I, I will say that these uh, regulations, these advisories are being constantly examined and, and retooled um, as, long, as well as drinking water and the like. This area is in complete flux, this science. And so it's not gonna go up the advisors are not going to go up. They're likely to go the other direction. They're likely to, to creep down over time and not up. And the state of Michigan and, and others are looking at this actively. So, you know, currently they're above this level, but, you know, it, they could go low. And that's it's probably not going to go higher. So, a um, few take-home points. Uh, PFOS levels in all 87 cell monitors were below the current consumption guidelines uh, issued by state of Michigan and uh, the broader Great Lakes Consortium. That's the good news. The European Food Safety Authority says um, is much lower and so most of the fish we measured were above their, their standard for safe consumption of a combined four compounds. And remember, there are many thousands of these, so this is just kind of tip of the iceberg. Um, Currently, as I mentioned, only PFAS is considered in these, region, in these regional guidelines, but you know, represents usually uh, the, the, the larger portion of PFAS, but not the only portion of PFAS you know, in these fish. It's an active area of research, you know, and these policy, make, policy making and guidelines are gonna evolve. I mean, it's, it, it's in complete flux, and you'll see a lot of changes here over the next uh, uh, decade or so, in, in my opinion. Okay, so uh, where are we going with this? Um, we're very fortunate to have uh, not only Sea Grant funding, but funding from other sources. What I mentioned with the uh, tissue, looking at the different tissues in fish and the different trophic position, whether you're a predator or a prey item and where you are in the food chain, that, that is being funded by the Great Lakes Fishery Trust on a fairly new project that Daniela is actually leading. Uh, we have a combined project from the Indiana DNR and NOAA to examine um, the tributaries to Southern Lake Michigan, where we know we have migratory fishes coming in and out of these systems, and even non-migratory ones. So we're, we're doing a synoptic survey of the entire south, um, southwest corridor here, 
to see where the hot spots of PFAS are in the river systems that flow into like even right here. And I, we were just passing through and there was a sampling point just a little ways from here that we, we sampled last month. So we're doing a synoptic survey of, of where the hot spots of PFAS might be in this uh, Southern Lake Michigan corridor uh, with funding from DNR and also uh, NOAA. And then Sea Grant comes in and allows us um, to lay a biotic component on top of this um, uh, project here. This is just for water and sediment that's funded by these sources. And uh, Sea Grant um, help is helping us out by allowing us to actually add the biota on top of that to see how the PFAS is moving through the food web of these streams and rivers here in the Southern Corridor and ultimately into fish and potentially into humans, especially those humans that are actually uh, harvesting and consuming fish from these rivers because maybe they have no other option. Okay, so um, thank, you, thank you all for your attention. This is the group of students and the funding agencies, et cetera. One of the best parts about this project is that students, graduate students and undergraduate students get great training in our labs and they're working on a real environmental contaminant. So thanks a bunch. Oh, you mean like um, invertebrates? Yeah. Well, oh, it's in it definitely in the I mean, it's in Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's in all the prey fish, which is how it's getting to well, the what predator fish. Is in their flesh as compared to what you're finding here. It's not predator, of course. It's oh. Them. Oh, yeah. The concentration is definitely lower, except in scopins. We can scroll back and look at this uh, this one in more detail because I think, as I said, this is the money slide right here, and so. Alewife right here, here's the concentration in alewife, right? The concentration in bloater and round gobies. Those are the ones we had a, a robust enough, a large enough sample size to feel confident about. And then here are the predators, here are the salmon. These are the same scale. So you can see the concentration here is between about 10 and 15. This is nanograms per gram, basically parts per billion in their flesh. And then the prey fish are down here. So they're definitely lower which suggests that if they're eating primarily alewife, like if you're a Chinook salmon eating alewife, you're bioconcentrating your food, and this is showing up in your flesh here. These are oddballs, these sculpin. We're still trying to sort of wrap our heads around why sculpin are so, are so loaded. Uh, might be because they're bottom dwelling, as I mentioned. It might be other life history. It might be diet. Because all these things are eventually, especially in, in young um, as when they're juveniles are eating invertebrates and so those invertebrates like zooplankton you know insects amphipods you know goes the list goes on and on have their own concentration we haven't gotten into those invertebrates yet and those invertebrates are eating microbes and algae from the water from the plankton the phytoplankton and also from the bottom and we haven't analyzed those two we have some samples that we're starting to get into but it's a food chain, right? And so this material is being taken up probably at the bottom of the food chain by algae, by bacteria and the like, moving through invertebrates, then into prey fish, and then into larger fish. So it's a bioaccumulation and biomagnification, which means you actually have higher concentrations in your food source as it moves up the food web. So it's a chain. And so it's hard to pinpoint, you know, exactly you know, where it's coming in, and you're also absorbing, they're in water, so you're absorbing some of these PFAS from the water column as well. So you're being bathed in, in, in these chemicals, and you're absorbing through your gills and through, uh, through your dermis and the like. And that's kind of, in, in water, there are many, they're both sort of medium, the, the media that they live in, and also the food source that becomes the, the source for uh, PFAS accumulation. Mm -hmm. No way to filter that. Yeah, it, so. it's limited, you know, and that's why the EPA is is uh, has an advisory set of new regulations on the six worst 
and the six most common PFAS compounds out there. And it's under advisement right now under public comment. And you can, you know, it, it's going to be very common that all, at least municipal <coughs> water supplies, will have to be tested on a regular basis for PFAS and it will have to be treated, run through charcoal filters, whatever, to remove PFAS as we sort of move along this road. It doesn't, you know, it, you just, but you can't test every well and every other source of water that people are consuming. It just, it's impossible. And so, but for municipal water supplies, and some states are already requiring this right now, that they be tested for PFAS. And then if, it, if the PFAS exceed whatever criteria, then it have to be treated uh, to remove it. I mean, there are ways of removing PFAS from water. Uh, it's not cheap, but it can be done. And it will have, probably have to be enforced uh, as we sort of move along. Yeah. Uh, but you know, a lot of places aren't making advisories for organic kale and this. So, uh, yeah. do you have any sense of like how how these concentrations in like Great Lakes fish compare to other day consumption for us? Right. Other sources of. Like yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have any sense of that? I'm gonna t I'm gonna turn that to Daniela. Yeah. Please. You want this? Do the Phil uh, Phil yeah. Donahue thing. Okay. Yeah. That is the Yeah, that's a really good point. PFAS does not become some uh, inert, harmless chemical. It usually converts. If anything happens, something happens to the head groups and not the, chlorine, uh, the carbon fluorine bond. And so it stays a PFAS, just converts to a different PFAS. Bummer. This is like, you know. Depressing talk. <laughs> Sorry. 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 Yeah. Yeah. But now, what about, okay, all of this runs into the ocean. Right. Or, Have, yeah. Has any been samples been taken of ocean fish? Actually, this is an expert. She did her dissertation right. on, ocean, on the ocean. Yeah. What about ocean fish? What about ocean fish? Is that basically the same, but you to say that the concentrations are lower than what we saw here? It does make sense if you think that like ocean uh, offshore fish, they are uh, far away from the source, the source of PFAS, so their concentration will be lower. And also they are growing in water as well. Yeah. Right, and, and, and some of Daniela's modeling actually has shown um, ocean circulation patterns uh, carry this stuff long distances from its source, say, you know, where she worked in Brazil, off the shore of Brazil. They have, there's a big problem in Brazil with PFAS because they use uh, um, an ant killer that has PFAS as its main ingredient and it, from the plantations and it runs offshore and then it disperses across the entire Atlantic. But yes, in ocean fish as well. Wherever water goes. Okay, now everyone's really depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well. Where's the line? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but remember, like, like anything, eating in moderation and eating, you know, the correct parts of the fish 
I think is is an advice is a is good advice. Thanks. Yeah. Well.